Sure. Sure. Um, today is um, November 20th, 2001. We're interviewing Mr. William Starrett Parkinson at the Culver Road Armory in Rochester, New York. Michael Akey, interviewer. Wayne Clark, videographer. Mr. Parkinson, where, where were you born, sir? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. And um, did you grow up in Pittsburgh? No. I grew up in South Central Pennsylvania. Uh, the town was Carlisle, PA, but I spent a lot of time in the mountains about 17 miles southwest. Okay, okay. Did you go to school in that area? I went to school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, high school. High school. What was high school like back then? Very, uh, I'm not sure how to say what was it like. Uh, my oh. mother was a school teacher. Mm -hmm. My father died when I was very young. At that time, married women were not hired as school teachers. So the point that I'm getting at is I was advised I had to behave extremely well or my mother could be fired. And so I made sure I towed the mark. Mm -hmm. I had two older sisters that I followed and they were very sharp academically. I always remember I was told, oh, you're Elizabeth and Howland's brother, we expect great things from you. A lot of pressure. A lot of rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we towed the line. Mm -hmm. When did you graduate from high school? I graduated in 1942. 1942. Our senior year was interesting. We began football practice the third week in August. The beginning of the fourth week, we showed up at the gym and the coach met us at the door, said everybody go home, football practice is canceled, school is delayed because of a polio epidemic. I returned to the mountains that after, that morning where I was living at the time, and the boy in whose home I had been visiting the previous night was dead from polio. So school was postponed. We finally began school the fourth week in September. Pearl Harbor hit. Rationing was on. Well, now, do you remember where you were when Pearl Harbor hit? Do you I certainly remember. I was up in the mountains, mm -hmm. and we drove into the town to Carlisle. I had gone up there to pick up a little rifle that I had left there. <laughs> and we got out of the car. Uh, and we lived in the heart of the town, and right across the street was a church, and the janitor of the church was sitting on the step, and he says, have you heard the news? The Japs have bombed Pearl Harbor, and I says, I'm ready. <laughs> Rifle in hand. You were, what, about 18, 19? No, I was uh, just seven. I had just turned 17. Just turned 17. Yeah, just, just literally. Okay. Did you uh, have any idea of what impact this is going to have on you at that point? I, I had some idea, but... Nothing in detail, because racing had been gone on. Uh, there were people who in the area had gone into services, and we had had one lad down the street who was in the Navy who had already been killed. Mm. I don't remember exactly where, but some idea. My mother, mother lost a brother in World <coughs> War I, so, but I had no idea what was going to take place. What was living under Russian, rationing like? We just accepted it. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, meats, lard, eggs, butter, sugar, very limited. Mm -hmm. But you just made do with what you had. And everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's in the same boat. But you see, we came out of Depression days. And having no father and my mother raising the four of us, three of us, uh, life was skimpy anyhow. In the town, we lived in only two bedrooms, a bathroom and a kitchen. Mm -hmm. So, we were used to doing without things. Now, once Pearl Harbor hit, uh, what was it like? What was the mood like in the high school, particularly among the young males who uh, their future was uncertain? Well, we pretty much felt we knew where we were going. Uh, all of a sudden, the colleges came out, and if they would take the top academic male students and let them get into college right away without even completing their high school work. Oh, really? Yeah. Two of my friends, Blake Sparr and um, Roger Schechter, left school. They were very intelligent young men and mm -hmm. went to college. Mm -hmm. And the, the draft was already underway, although not the full effect. Right. Now, you graduated from uh, high school in Carlisle? Yes. <coughs> and uh, what did you do upon graduation? 
Well, I had a scholarship to Dickinson College, which is located in Carlisle. Uh, but I, I took the first semester, but I knew exactly what was going to happen, so I was there for just a good time. I received the letter. I turned 18 November 26th, and the letter was in the mail November 27th, report for a physical. Mm -hmm. So uh, that semester I was just going to college but having fun. And uh, reported for a physical, went in for examination in early March of 43, and off I went. went. Okay, now um, did you know you were going into the Navy at that point? No. I. My buddy and I, prior to the being inducted, uh, went to a Marine recruiting office. I was interested in getting in the Marines, as was he. The Marine recruiting officer was on the telephone. Wait a minute, boys. Put the telephone down. What are you here for? We'd like to enlist. He asked my friend how old he was. He was 17, myself 18. He says, I can take the 17-year-old, but I can't take you, the 18-year-old. I just got orders not to touch any 18-year-olds. So my buddy did go to the Marines, so I waited for the draft. I did not want the Army. You, you, that you were sure of? That I was sure of. There were no possibilities for the Air Force that day. There were no openings for the Marines, so I took the Navy because I felt, at least in the Navy, I might have a chance to learn something. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact I was not too gung-ho about facing somebody at the end of my rifle to kill them. Now, um, where did you go for basic? Uh, Bainbridge Naval Training Center. It was a brand new camp being established at that time. Okay. What was that like? Okay, well, first of all, the base was just being built. There weren't any hard roads. It was all mud. Uh, new buildings. Uh, just to get us through the various routines of blood tests. and. Mm -hmm uniforms and trying to get us oriented to military thinking. It was only six weeks and we were out of there. Really? Uh, get our shots and so on and so forth. Was this your, your first time away from home? No. no. Okay. I had been away from home before, but okay. uh, it, was, it was a mess, but we realized the objective was just to crank out people. Right. So I was there for six weeks and I was fortunate enough to then be assigned to the school and the field in which I had asked for my second choice. My first choice was photography, my second choice was electrical. Mm -hmm. And I was assigned to electrical school which was being built in Bainbridge. As a matter of fact, the first week and a half at the school we helped clean up the classrooms and carry in chairs <laughs> and so on and raise chalkboards. Mm -hmm. but then I spent four months in Bainbridge's electrical training school and after the four months we came out with a rating of a third-class electrician. How was the training? Very quick, very... <laughs> Here it is, boys, goodbye. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you did, you were passed. Mm -hmm. uh, we realized they just had to outfit ships. Right, right. And as I say, after four months in this school, I was rated third class, which would normally would have taken two or three years to obtain. Mm -hmm. And where did you go then? All right, from there I was assigned to uh, further training in Brooklyn at the um, Brooklyn Consolidated Edison Generating Plant. Uh, we were supposed to learn about steam generation, mm -hmm. but this is a tremendously big plant. And I spent four weeks there, which was just really fun time. Uh, stationed at the receiving station and every other night Liberty up in town New York go to the stage door canteen get tickets to a play <laughs> get a bite to eat it was fun time mm -hmm. and then from there I was a, I was sent up to the Charleston Navy Yard where the Benyon was being built oh, it, so you're a plank holder it was not even commissioned yet uh -huh. there were I, I don't recall exactly but there were perhaps 30 of us assigned to it the purpose being to kind of learn a little bit about the ship, where things were, checking in spare parts. Mm -hmm. The ship was commissioned December 14th, 1943, at which time the rest of the crew came on board. So you, you were really right from the beginning. I was one of the very few that rode that ship from before she was commissioned to tie her up at the last turn of her screw mm -hmm. in San Diego on 46.
Do you have your plank holder certificate? No. <laughs> we never had such things. Oh, really? We never had them. Oh, interesting. The, uh, now, who was the first captain? Captain Joshua Cooper. What was he like? Oh, I'm sorry. He was Commander Joshua Cooper. It's tough to characterize him because perspective has changed things tremendously. We thought he was pretty standoffish. But it turned out just the opposite was true. He was a thorough, thorough skipper. He retired as rear admiral. I could tell you a little story very quickly. He died uh, two years ago this February. The word was passed around, and about 14 or 15 of us got to Annapolis, Mary, Annapolis Naval Base, where the uh, funeral service was held. When the family learned that there were this small group of us who came, they wanted us to sit right in the front row. That's wonderful. I'm a little emotional, obviously. That's okay. Because Admiral Cooper always said the Benyon was his favorite ship. His favorite ship. So what did you think of the Benyon? With hindsight, she was. Well, you're a 19-year-old kid on this ship. Uh, did you like it at first? It was all new to me. Mm -hmm. Little story there. Sure. When we were commissioned, we... Those of us who had been there before were living off in a dormitory. But when she was commissioned, we were assigned to bunk on the ship. And I thought, well, here I am, a third-class electrician, never been out to sea before. Be smart. Strike up buddies with another electrician who's an upper rating. Make friends with him. He'll help you. Lo and behold, right next to me was a bunk. Stan Comadina, electrician made second class. Oh, you got it made. When he came down to his bunk and I introduced myself and I said, you know, this is, I've never been on board a ship. He said, this is the first day I've ever set foot on a ship. <laughs> we are still friends to this state. That's wonderful. We went through college together. We've maintained contact. We're still close friends to this state. <laughs> so, you're both, so pretty much the whole crew was... Uh... Pretty much the whole crew was green. Oh. But it was the result of... At that time, Commander Cooper and his executive lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander Balsh, and a few others, whose avowed purpose was to whip us into shape. How'd they go about doing it? Drill, 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 drill. <clears throat> now, what were your duties? As an electrician on a small ship like the destroyer, our, our responsibilities were all the electrical uh, service and anything that ran on electricity. Mm -hmm. Take care of it, except the, um, though that equipment in the combat mm -hmm. information center, which was the radar, <clears throat> the radar, mm -hmm. the communications. In other words, we were responsible for maintenance of all the electrical. It was divided basically up into a lighting gang and a power gang and we would serve both areas. There were only about 10 of us. Mm -hmm. Where was your action station? Okay, my initial battle station was in the number one five-inch gun. Uh, the Fletcher-class destroyer, which she was, had five five-inch guns. Now, was this an early Fletcher? That I can't clearly say. She probably wasn't the first, nor was she the last. But so you're in the you're in the five inch forward five inch number one five inch. In that gun, the gun crew is composed of a pointer, a trainer, one who handles the powder cases, one who handles handles the shells. Then below that are two men who push the shells and the powder cases up and then there's one person down in the hatch down below. I was a pointer. My direction was to point the gun this way. The okay. trainer would control the rotation. There was a gun captain also. Okay. Now the gun could be controlled either from the main battery director, which was up on top of the ship, 
or individually controlled. Uh, if it was individually controlled, the pointer and the trainer were the ones who were advised by the target through earphones from the gun captain, and we both had to lock in the fire. We were told when to lock in. I was on that battle station through the initially clear through the completion of the uh, invasion of Saipan and Tinian. Then I was changed to damage control station. There were three damage control stations, one forward, one midships, one aft. I was the electrician on the aft damage control station. The damage control party would be made up of a machinist, an electrician, a pharmacist mate, and some upper rank person in charge of it. Mm -hmm. When general quarters were sounded, each of us would have to go secure a part of the ship. In order to have people on the damage control stations familiar with other parts of the ship, we would be assigned, for example, I was on the aft damage control, but to secure the ship, I was assigned to the forward third of the ship. Mm -hmm. So when battle stations uh, sounded, I was to go up and secure, make sure all the appropriate hatches were locked, the uh, unnecessary ventilation lines shut down, unnecessary circulation shut down. Mm -hmm. So that was my job. When GQ sounded, go forward, secure the ship, come back, stand by my battle station. When it was over, unsecure. Now, you had your shakedown cruise. Yep. What was that like? That was an experience. We went to Bermuda and a lot of training by the ship. Mm -hmm. A lot of training, a lot of shooting, uh, both air targets and land targets. Uh, the captain made sure that we, all of us, each one of us, got at least one day's liberty at Hamilton. Uh, with hindsight, I should have enjoyed it more than I did. <laughs> but uh, we had an experience because after the shakedown was approved and okayed, we made a power run from Bermuda up to Boston. Mm -hmm. Power run means you operate at max power for four hours. You're testing the engineering equipment. And when we got up to the North Atlantic, it was cold and bitter, bitter and cold. But it was an experience. Mm -hmm. And then we were back in Boston and uh, into the, back to the Charleston Navy Yard for touch-up work by the uh, civilian mm -hmm. Navy, uh, not civilian, by the civilian people who built the ship. Was it a fairly seaworthy ship? Uh Based on what we went through, absolutely. But it was rough. Yeah. It was rough. Now, uh, once you go through your shakedown, where's your first uh, combat cruise? All right, let me carry on. Sure. Final, the uh, completion of the work by the Naval Yard. We went then, then went to Philadelphia where we picked up uh, one of the small carriers, the Baton escorted her down through the Caribbean, through the canal, up to the west coast, and to uh, Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. At Pearl Harbor, we were then assigned some very special duty and extensive training. And finally, the first part of June, we were part of the invasion fleet to Saipan and Tinian. Okay. And because of our special duty, we had while we were in Pearl Harbor, very extensive radio equipment was brought on board because we were going to become what was called a fighter director ship. There were not too many of those destroyers. They were equipped with a lot of radio equipment. Their prime purpose was to be out in advance of the fleet on the movements to pick up any enemy movement radar, submarine, <coughs> or so forth. And then on every invasion that we are, were involved with, we were there three days ahead of time to support the underwater demolition squads. So it's like a picket ship. We were a picket ship. As a matter of fact, we received the presidential unit citation for our work as a picket ship. Mm. But not only that, uh, the extra radio equipment was brought on because then Marine or Army officers would come on board to communicate with the appropriate invasion troops uh, on shore and we would give them the heavy fire support when they needed it, especially during the invasion, because they can't carry all the artillery in with them. 
What the, um, so Saipan was your first? Saipan uh, was the first one. What was that like? Again, it was interesting because being our first combat, we were doing the job of doing picketing, supplying uh, shore bombardment. Uh, so we were kept busy. Uh, it was all new to us, so yeah, you, you <laughs> your stomach was in knots at times, but mm -hmm. then we learned that we, we all did our jobs and worked together and, and things went well. And we later came to realize what Saipan was all about in Tinian. Of course, being on the gun, I can remember one funny story softening up Tinian, which was right after Saipan. Uh, there were a lot of sugarcane fields on Tinian. And by experience, we knew that the Japanese Army people would lay in these sugarcane fields, and the American Army forces, Marines come in. It provided a very dangerous place. So we went around shooting white phosphorus into these sugarcane fields to burn down the sugarcane. Mm -hmm. I remember we spotted my pointer and trainer. We spotted an old farmhouse up there in the back, and we spotted a little outhouse. Well, let's have a little fun. So we gun kept, hey, yeah, go get it. So we trained, pointed out, and pulled the trigger, and all. <laughs> I hate to say it because it was human life. But no sooner had we fired, and the, the yacht house door comes flying open, and out comes some Japanese soldier pulling up his pants. <laughs> you can imagine sitting in an outhouse having a five-inch shell go by. It, it's funny, but it's still sad. It was human. At that time, you didn't. You were so mentally trained that you didn't think about it. Of course, at Saipan, we had the experience. Uh, it was one that's left a great impression on me. I don't know how familiar you are with Saipan, but towards the end, they had crowded a lot of the Japanese soldiers and civilians into one very small area, and they were trying to get them to give up, and mm -hmm. they wouldn't give up, and they found that some of them would come marching out with their hands up or have a machine gun tied on their back or hand grenades in their pockets. So the order was just shoot, and this was the area where you will see occasional films of women jumping off cliffs while we were right there shooting into that. How far offshore were you? We were as close to the shore as that ship could possibly get at times. I don't think we were 100 yards. So you were actually firing at individual targets as opposed to just general... Well, in this case we were doing... Uh, oh, I forget what... Area which, fire? Uh, yeah, where you time it and fuse it and just let scatter out. We were not just waiting for him, uh, impact. Mm -hmm because the objective there was to kill as many as you could. Mm -hmm. And I can remember seeing these women and children jumping off the cliffs right through our... But we, we had to be within 100 yards right off the rocky shores. That isn't close. Well, we were in close quite a few times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I may, I remember Iwo Jima, we were less than a half a mile right off the beachhead firing. Well, uh, and you could, we, could, we could see what was going on. Frequently, the destroyers were cited for being very helpful because of that. Well, I could tell you some more stories. But. So at Saipan, I had that experience, which left a deep impression on me. Here we are killing these women and children. And they weren't going to do us, but yet they weren't the cause of the war, but they're the one who paid the price. Were you thinking about those things? Is not then, not then, not then, not then. Okay. no. But that's the impression you get after a while. Sure. After Saipan? Tinian. Tinian. Okay. That was for us a fairly, fairly quiet activity. We were picketing and picking up aircraft and shooting down aircraft. What uh, was uh, the aircraft the largest threat you had to deal with? Over the total war, yes. At that point, though? At that point, no. Shore batteries. Okay. They, they were firing back. Were they but, any good? They, they, they just let us know you were there. Okay. Although I can remember one night on Saipan, apparently, also as well as a few other ships, apparently hit the gasoline farm for the airfield. And boy, I can remember when that thing blew. Tremendous. At the Asolito Airfield. Yeah. 
tremendous, I don't remember the name of it, but I know it was on the uh, end between Saipan and Tinian. Mm -hmm. She really lit up the sky. Now gasoline itself doesn't explode, but it's the fumes, but once you get it and then the burning goes on. Mm -hmm. After uh, <coughs> Tinian, where does the ship go? Well, uh, after Tinian we went back to um, resupply. Then the next uh, uh, operation was what's called Palu or Pelelu. Mm -hmm. And uh, our job there was shore bombardment, give the underwater demolition squad boys some protection by firing in again. You're getting in fairly close. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I swear I remember at actually 9 o'clock, the hour of the landing, I could not understand how there could be a, a living animal on the beach. And they were there, Bloody Nose Ridge, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of details. That's where I saw my first ship sunk. I saw it, an old, old tin can hit, and about a minute and a half she was gone. Mine or shore battery? I, I don't remember exactly what hit her. Mm -hmm. And I know we were doing a lot of running back and forth because there were rumors about the Japanese were bringing in rafts with the troops and equipment, shore battery, firing, shore support. Airplanes were not the big problem there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what task force were you generally part of? All right, because of the nature of our function, we were never per se assigned to a task force. Okay. Because the operation, say, Saipan Yantin, would be one basic activity. Then the Marines and the Army hit Peleliu, that was another group. So we would jump from this to that. Okay. And that was our mode of operation because of this fighter director shore bombardment activity, picket duty. We, we never were assigned to any fleet per se. Okay. And thus it became a problem for us for supplies. You are sort of a, uh, an orphan. That's right. But we got supplies. There's where, advantages to that. Well, there were because uh, we were called upon for a lot of duty. That mm -hmm. I can recall because of that duty, if I may express it, I remember in one la one year I was on land less than eleven, 11 less than eleven hours because we were just going from one right to the other. Mm -hmm. The only time I ever got on an island was when we had had to go to resupply. Mm -hmm. How did that um, constant duty, uh, what kind of an impact did that have on the crew? Extremely tiring. Mm -hmm. Extremely tiring. Mentally, physically. How, were, how did you deal with that? Just kept going. Just kept going. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know what else to say than that. It just kept going and going. Any recreation on board? Well, we had a movie projector, which I would run once in a while, but uh, that was only when we would be back for pick up supplies. Where were you generally resupplying yeah. for the change? Manus comes to mind, but right now I don't okay. actually recall. After Peleliu, uh... Uh, the invasion of the Philippines, Lady. Again, we arrived at Lady. Of course, everything was delayed there a little bit because of a tremendous hurricane. Mm -hmm. But we arrived there um, three days ahead of time, participated in shore bombardment uh, ahead of time during the invasion. We received our first damage from shore batteries. Uh, we were softening up the shore. I can't recall how far off the shoreline we were, but there was a destroyer in front of us and one in back of us, behind us and a cruiser further out and showing over us. And uh, we knew we were being taken under fire by a shore battery. And here's a little bit of a story. One of the officers was outside the main battery director, visually trying to see where the shore battery was located. And he saw a flash and he turned Lieutenant Robinson turned and looked up to the uh, Lieutenant Holloway, the gun director, to point to it. 
he lost his arm right at the shoulder. The shore battery hits. Now I mentioned Lieutenant Holloway. He later rose to become Chief of Naval Operations. We had a pretty distinguished group on board. We did. <clears throat> but, uh, so during the invasion, uh, we were shot, uh, bombarding and contact with the boys that hit the beach where they needed some heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. At night, radar picket duty. Mm -hmm. Then the Battle of Saragal Straits. What was that like? You want to talk about your heart and your throat? That was it. Throat. Now, you know, that's a well-documented battle. Well, what's your perspective on the battle? My perspective on it, we were assigned to make a torpedo run on the battleships when they crossed the T, if you're familiar with that operation. One of many destroyer groups. Can I remember when the word came down, we're going in. Full power, we made the run, fired 10 fish. And I can remember the shells from the battleships back of us going overhead, sounding exactly like a freight train. Mm -hmm. Going right over us. We closed into 5,000 yards when we threw, yeah, 5,000 yards. Dumped 10 fish at her, at the Yamashiro. That's a big target. I can remember her taking her hits. I can see her taking the hits from the battle wagons. 5,000 yards. Uh, a little over three miles. A little yeah. under three miles. Right. What and that, that's documented. Right. And uh, I could prove pull out the history there where our skipper threw five tent fish. He was only supposed to f fire five, but he said he never got the order. <laughs> <laughs> and. The second thing is, Lieutenant Commander Balsh, and I personally heard this told to me by the commander himself, he was a very, very hard person to get along with. When he came on board the Benyon, he'd just come off a destroyer that had been sunk and he lost quite a few crew, and his avowed purpose was he was not going to have another crew shot out from under him. He was going to drill the riggers out of us, which he did. So during the Battle of Sarago Straits, even though he was down in the CIC room responsible for our those, I learned later that he was more or less set back almost falling asleep. And why? Because he said, I knew the crew was trained. Hmm. But he had ordered the fish set for 20 plus feet depth, where the order was supposedly only about 15 feet. Why? because he knew the battle wagons had their armor plating down about 15 and he wanted to get down in under them. And so the timing by our assistant gunnery officer from firing the torpedoes when the explosions were heard on the Yamashiro, uh, we got partial credit for help sinking her, but they really feel the ones that we sent down at 20 feet plus got into the keel and busted her up. Mm. We, I can remember seeing her guns, and I can remember those shells going over us. Of course, one of our sister ships, the Grant, got hit coming out of there because she turned, unfortunately, the wrong way. What was your station during this? I was in damage control, damage top, control? top side, and could see the whole thing. Really? You just stand there and just see the whole thing. Technically, you should have been inside. But <laughs> You're a kid at that point. Well, the whole damage control party was outside. Mm -hmm. And I can remember seeing the whole thing and the shells going over their head and the ships getting hit. And then that morning, when it became light, we were assigned to pursue one of the Japanese destroyers that had escaped all of it. And went after her, we shot down a couple of airplanes in the meantime. <clears throat> and uh, I don't remember how the destroyer got hit, but she was sunk and as we were going right over her, her Mines went off, and boy, did that shake us up. Mm. Then came the word that the other fleet from San Bernardino, the Japanese fleet, was coming in and attacking all the baby flat tops, and right. turned around and hightailed it out of there. And of course, the Japanese turned and left before we got out there. But mm -hmm. so, what's 
what are your what's what's your visual impression of a night action? Tension. Tension. Well, that's not visual. I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. it's, it's tension, but you see the shells going forth. We were not exactly being in the not in the center of communications exactly what was where. Mm -hmm. We had a general idea as the skipper could try to keep us informed what was what going on. But you see these these 16 inch and you hear them and you see them when they hit. And it's just a lot of and of course there's the smell. Mm -hmm. That's another sense. What kind of smell? The gunpowder smell. Port yeah. yeah, and all of that because it's not only from you. We didn't fire any guns, but it's, it's, it permeates the area. Well, you weren't firing any guns? No, we didn't fire any guns. We were primarily torpedo runs. Okay. See, the objective was the Japanese fleet was coming in here and they had to turn. Our boys were out there firing over, scoot in and get out. Okay. And as soon as we dumped the torpedoes, hightail it and make smoke. Mm -hmm. But uh, the visual impression is just, you know, gun flashes are going everywhere, and you just hope none of them are coming at you. And you could just make out the outline of the, the Japanese oh, vessels? Oh, no question, but I could visually see it. Mm -hmm. Any other sh Japanese vessels? Oh, yeah, there was the other one, the Fuchsia, mm -hmm. and there were some tin cans. But because everything is a flash, it's not a continuous flash. It's flashes you get glimpses of. Uh, as I said, that following morning we went out, we were assigned to get after this one left destroyer and there were Japanese floating in the water and we would try to pick up some of them and boy they they just clear out of it. They wanted nothing to do with it and of course when the time came we got the word the Japanese fleet was coming in we just, as I say, we shot down a plane. I have an article here from Admiral Holloway something about a night to remember of all the things we did that night. Mm -hmm. And he was up in the gun directory, mm -hmm. directing and watching all of it. Now, you uh, you had radar at that point? Yes, we had radar. Okay. Two radars, surface and air. Okay. okay. Now, after, uh, after Lady? After Lady, we continued shore bombardment and picket duty for a while. Then we pulled back to uh, Ulysses, I think it was. Uh, to resupply, and uh, then we got a hurry-up call to get back to the Philippines for Mindoro, or Mindanao, I'm sorry, Mindanao. That was, they just apparently just wanted some ships there because Mindanao and Mindoro were almost no big operation at all. Did you uh, cross the equator at all? Yes, we crossed the equator eight times. So uh, you're a shellback? Oh, yeah. Have your certificate? Yeah. What was, what was the first timeline? Well, the skipper took a little time out and allowed us to have the typical polywog shell back, and they had planned all of it, you know, so on and so forth. And off the number five gun, they tied up a great big canvas and filled it with seawater and garbage and everything imaginable. And a lot of them dressed up and. Uh, Pretty yeah. much the whole crew were shellbacks at that point. Pretty much the whole crew. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. But that was the only time we ever did do that. Mm -hmm. Let us just change sure. tapes for sure. a moment. Sure, sure. Well, that's the reason. I, I personally just could not kill somebody, look at taking the end of a gun, and but yet I knew I had to do something. I like just was not a total conscientious objector, but those guys on, on Saipan, Tinian, and those guys on Iwo especially. Oh. Better of course, be in the Navy. We were in communication with them because of the right. support. Right. So we had some idea. Well, I forget the name of the town on Saipan, the sugar mill. Oh, I forget the name of that little town there and how these guys were... We were more than glad to stand by those guns all hours of the day and night, mm -hmm. be on general quarters for two or three days at a time. Really? Oh, yeah. It's, it's a long time. And you would have to make a little, oh, oh yes, it's a long time. Then you'd have to make a little short relief for the guys who need to get out and stretch. Mm -hmm. But. Um,
Now, uh, I don't dismiss any of these things lightly because sure. every one of them has so many detailed stories. Now, uh, you were in at least one typhoon. The typhoon, we were in two of them. Okay. The one uh, just before the invasion of Lady. Right. Then there was another one. It was either just before or after the invasion of Lingaya or Luzon. In the South China Sea, we were pulled out. And if I may, I can recall accurately the three destroyers, three Fletcher class destroyers, were flipped over and sunk. Really? And I could look in my history books here and pull their names out. This is documented history. We survived it. Unfortunately, they got caught, caught with their ballast, not properly ballasted, and they were flipped over and sunk with over a thousand lives lost. It's in the history books, but you never heard about it. Right. What the? Uh, what was it like trying to ride one of those out? <sighs> Grab and hold on. <laughs> Don't try to go forward aft on a Fletcher class because there's everything is topside. Yeah. And one moment you could be standing there looking down at the bottom of a. Oh, well, what shall I say? A wave bottom of mm -hmm. pit. And you're up there 40, 45 feet, and the next moment you're at the bottom looking up, and here she comes, baby. You better grab and hold on if you're topside. Uh, it's going to take you with you. Those things, those things are rolling. <sighs> I'm not going to try to quote the degrees on rolling and pitching, but I don't know if you're aware of it, but the destroyers, at least ours and others, anything above, of course, they have only one deck, the main deck. The rest are all platforms. But on the main deck, roughly midships, when they built them, they overlap the plates mm -hmm. so that when they pitch, the plates can stretch. Real? Oh, yeah. And if you ever know the Fletcher class and other destroyers were built, welds were never straight, always zigzagged. Because they're like toilet paper. If they had weld straight, they'd right, right there. But you could stand midship and see those plates. Slide back three and four inches from pitching. Must have been a little disconcerting. <laughs> what do you say <laughs> you're there? <laughs> yes, that, that typhoon in the China Sea was really absolutely horrible. But the skipper was able to. Uh, he kept that. us through it. That's good. He kept us through it. Mm. Now, yeah, it was still Cooper. I was still Cooper skipper just there. When did you get a change of skipper? Right now, I honestly don't recall, but I think it was after the Philippines. Okay. Yeah, it was somewhat after the Philippines, Who before came Iwo. A fella by the name of Holmes, H O L M E S, at that time, 32 years old, the youngest commander skippering a destroyer at that time. Really? Tremendous guy, tremendous. What was his uh, background? I really don't know. Yeah, I really never did know. Or? No, no, he was USN. Okay. He was USN. Academy graduate, but I never did know what his previous experience as a skipper or as in the Navy was. Good skipper? Oh, tremendous skipper. He saved our lives more than once. Hmm. Disobeying orders. Disobeying orders? Disobeying orders. Oh, well, let's have an example. Sir. Well, on picket duty at Okinawa. Mm -hmm. When he saw them coming, he had us on standby full power. He took off. He zigzagged everything else. Mm -hmm. He didn't just keep us going straight. When, uh, when so, was, was that your first experience with kamikazes? No, the first experience was uh, in the Philippines. In the Philippines. After Mindoro was the invasion of uh, Luzon, Lingang Gulf. And again, because of our function, we were quickly assigned to that and that operation, and we were way out ahead of the fleet. We were the first surface vessel past Baton and Corregidor since MacArthur left. Mm -hmm. Now I'm excluding PT boats. All right. And we, when I was going up by the Baton and Corregidor, there were two Japanese destroyers that came out to decide to investigate us. The fleet was way behind. We had been spotting aircraft and air movements and calling in from air support from the carriers and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. 
But these this two destroyers came out and decided to tangle with us. <coughs> One of the stupidest things they ever decided to do, all they would have had to done, they come out in line, would be to split and come down either side of us. Sure. But they didn't. They just kept going in line. We fired at them, they fired at us. And finally we got the orders, we're going too far off our directed line to get back. Mm -hmm. So we, we pulled back in. Did you get any hits? We got a couple hits, but not enough to sink them. Mm -hmm. But they were splashing all around us. And if you've ever seen a Fletcher class destroyer, let's go back at the Philippines when we took that shore battery hit. Quarter inch steel doesn't stop much. One of those uh, shrapnels went right in the warhead of one of our big torpedoes. Never blew it. Mm. If it would have. <laughs> but quarter inch steel doesn't take much to go through. A 45 would go through it. 5 16th inch at the fire room, fire room and engine room bulkhead. <laughs> it's not very much steel, is it? No. But uh, none of them, they didn't hit us. Well, the one at the Philippines did some damage. But. Um, now, your first experience with kamikazes, what, um, what was that like? Personally, yeah. I got to be candid. I had two feelings. I had a feeling like I was going to lose air, every bit of control of my waste systems. And I wanted to run. But where am I going to run? Because you're standing there and you know they're coming right for you. At what point did you realize? Now, had you heard about kamikazes prior? Yeah, yeah okay. we had heard about them. All right. So you you had some knowledge of what may be coming. Oh yeah. And then when you see the first one coming at you, especially being topside like that. But I got to the point eventually. I just said, "Oh, the hell with it. I hope they hit us." As a matter of fact, going way ahead in the story, I got a piece of one right in that book. Just missed me by fractions of an inch. Mm. You got there so you could just stand and look at him and say, take me out, buddy. Get me out of here. Well, but you guys got the upper hand. Yep. But, uh, yeah, our first experience with kamikazes was in the Philippines. Incidentally, did you ever hear a major bong? The war ace, flying P-38s. We directed him in some of his kills in the Philippines. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, See, that's the thing we would do is our radio, our radar and fighter director activity would pick up the movements and then the Army or the Navy or whoever Marines had something available, we, we would vector them in. Now, running that equipment, uh, were they people from other service branches? We operated, I mean the Benyon, operated the equipment. Okay. Uh, but we generally had at least one or two officers. Okay. Uh, like at Iwo, we had Marine officers on board. Okay. At Okinawa, we had Marines and Army officers on board okay. who had obviously the coordinates and all that. And they were coordinating with? With the guys on the shore. Okay. Interesting. But Major Bong, I remember clearly. Did you ever meet him? No. No. Okinawa. Well, forgive me, but after sure. Ling Gang Golf, that, that was quite an experience. What was that like? Kamikaze attacks. I remember Ling Gang Golf's a very long golf. I can remember them flying in there, and the Tennessee was in there. Tennessee, the battle wagon. I can clearly, I just got to. My mind right now, I clearly see a kamikaze coming in, hit her, hitting her number one turret, and just bouncing off. I can remember the battle wagons. Learned the posture was to carry powder bags and their big 16-inch guns, and just point them in the direction, and blow. <laughs> that took some of them out. But uh, I can remember a funny little story. The Lingang Golf. Lingang Golf was a area <clears throat> in which obviously many wealthy people built some lovely, lovely homes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
and the Japanese inf infiltrated these houses and would sit there and potluck shot at all the under demolition was squad boys trying to soften up and clear the beaches mm -hmm. and so on. And I can remember we got orders. To, I was not on the gun, but I was in communicate. Let's take out that one beautiful mansion there, and a few rounds were fired. And I can remember some Japanese soldiers coming, running out of the house and climbing up in a palm tree. I don't know how they did it, but one of the 40 millimeter guns said, "Let me take the palm tree down." <laughs> so they shot the palm tree right off at the base. <laughs> but uh, the Japanese and Ling Gang Golf learned the technique. I won't say they learned it, but they acquired and used the technique. Is at night when the ships were quiet. They would come out in the water, maybe with a, a box over their head or something, come up alongside a small ship like a cannon, throw a hand grenade or a small bomb on it. So we would stand guard duty all night. I remember one night I was on guard duty there and saw this object out in the water, called up. I said, yeah, it sure looks like a body. Okay, fire. So I, they made sure no ship was in the area and I, so I fired and the thing kept floating in. It was a side of beef. One of the LSTs, a supply ship, got sunk in. It was a side of beef floating in. <laughs> we didn't put that one up on the <laughs> marker wall. You didn't get credit for that. <laughs> I'll never forget. But that was an experience because you learned you never could let down. Yeah. Nighttime or anything else. Hmm. But then after Lynn Gam go off back to Ulithi to form up to head for Iwo Jima. And Iwo Jima was another operation in which two battleships from the old, old battleships, the Texas and the New Yorker, were assigned to participate in Iwo Jima. Well, the New Yorker, in the way out to the Pacific after the conclusion of Europe, had lost one of her screws. So they still wanted her to participate, so they sent us in another ship they escort the New Yorker in such a way that they, we would arrive at Iwo at the same time the, mm -hmm. the rest of the proposed fleet. And this is a documented case. We were on our way sailing up there, and the New Yorker obviously had command of the three-unit <laughs> fleet. And all of a sudden, the New Yorker anti-aircraft guns opened fire. And of course, I happened to be up on the quarter deck for some work, and I heard this going on. And, Quickly, how come you don't want firing on the target? Well, of course, some of our officers were experienced, and they went out and shot the target, or with a sextant and so on, because they couldn't pick up anything on radar. Shot the area. Well, it turns out it was right in the area where Venus was. And so they <laughs> called back and said, we're sorry, our little five inches won't reach Venus. <laughs> That's, again, documented in the history. <laughs> Nothing was heard from the New Yorker. <laughs> They didn't take any credit for that one. <laughs> but that was, what a comment. Our little five-inch guns, we, they won't reach Venus. <laughs> it obviously was some sort of a mirage up in that area, and their guys saw something being new to the Pacific. Eh? Mm. But then he will, and that was quite an experience. Providing uh, shore? Shore, picket duty, and... Uh, Again, in these documents, there are the messages from back some of the Marines. And the Marines, I remember on the northern end of Iwo Jima, particularly, a small group of Marines had having trouble with one cave, and the communications went on and vectored in on them. Apparently, one of our shells went right down the throat, and they let us know that, boy, you saved us. And of course, kamikazes were there. And uh, we were there for over 30 days. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you another story. This is true. I was up on the quarter deck again. Uh, February 16th was the first carrier-based raid on Tokyo since Doolittle. Mm -hmm. The fleet that conducted that raid was made up of the big 27,000-ton carriers and the smaller converted baby flat tops, if you knew of those. Well, they couldn't, they didn't have the speed, so they were kept further out from Tokyo. Well, one of their pilots over Tokyo got hit, damaged, I should say, and he knew he couldn't make it back to his own carrier, so he communicated back and asked, you know, factory men to one of the big carriers, which they did, 
And as he approached, he called in, yeah, we know you're coming, get in the pattern. And just as he started to descend, he called in and he said, which runway do you want me to come in on? Because <laughs> if you ever see these baby flat tops, have you ever seen one of those? Those pilots were the greatest pilots in the world, bar none. They had more intestinal fortitude to fly off those. And after trying to land on one of those to see this 27, <laughs> which runway do you want me to come in on? <laughs> Broke them up. <laughs> That's a true story. But uh, kamikaze, submarines, Iwo Jima. And then we pulled back for uh, Okinawa. Now, Okinawa was a real surprise. Why so? Well, first of all, D-Day was Easter Sunday morning, April 1st, mm -hmm. Fool's Day. The hour was at 9 o'clock. There was almost no opposition. We had a few kamikazes come at us that night, or that morning, but there was no opposition on the beachhead. <laughs> Little did we know what was coming. Little did we know what was coming. So that was so unusual. Of course, we had been there with the underdog demolition squad teams mm -hmm. and radar picket duty and so on, but later that turned out to be a, what people know as the mess. Mm -hmm. Do you provide fire support at all? Uh, an awful lot. Okay. An awful lot of radar picket duty. Mm -hmm. Because if I may, based on experience, uh, they assigned us to the most dangerous radar picket duty. Consistently, we, so we were signed up there. And uh, we were hit a couple of times, nothing major. Matter of fact, the piece of the kamikaze in there was one of them that hit us. And as I said, I'm here just by fractions of an inch, but I got a piece of it. It's a memento. Where did the plane hit? All right, the plane came in from the starboard quarter, circled around, was coming in on the port side, hit the water maybe 100 yards off the ship, and then like a skipping stone right up into the ship. And I remember I ducked. Hmm. A little story there is the five inch number four five inch gun was up above the deck and there were very close lifelines around that. And when they throw the big brass shells out the back, they will tend to clog up. And so they were firing off the starboard side, and I had jumped up with asbestos gloves and was just heaving the shells over the side when I heard the hydraulics cranking around. And I looked up and I saw this suicide coming in. I, I can't stay here. The gun can't turn. So I jumped and went down on the deck below the, the deck. And when I hit, my ankles went out from under me, and I couldn't get up. Mm. And I there laying looking, and I just ducked. The pieces went all around me. Lifeline was snapped. I remember that thing zinging right over my head. Lucky fellow. That's why I keep that piece around. <laughs> I remember I'm here. But we took another hit one time. And uh, shot down quite a few of them. As a matter of fact, the uh, Admiral of the Fleet called out to us one night when we shot down two in very short order and he radioed back to us. He says, you're keeping up your reputation as the best or nearly the best fighting destroyer out here. Quite a compliment. How many uh, kamikazes were you credited? No. Altogether, I think there were 18 that we shot down. Then our combat air patrol I think shot down something like 32, mm -hmm. the ones that we directed. But uh, so you were off e, um, Okinawa for how long? Well, we arrived there uh, March 27th. We left the latter part of May. Now, there was a typhoon off of Okinawa. We didn't get caught, didn't in, get that caught in that. No, we didn't get caught in that one. But I've seen a lot of ships get hit. Another one of our sister ships, the Newcomb, here again, she took five kamikazes and yet she's still afloat. And I've seen others that 
There's a little story here again. About a maybe a year ago, I got a flyer in the mail about a book why Truman dropped a bomb. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I knew the story, but you always want to see if there's another side of it. Well, I asked the library to get the book for me through the interlibrary loan. Well, I, mm -hmm. the book received the book about oh maybe four months ago, and I looked at it, and it was about the kamikazes and the destroyers that were damaged at Okinawa and the projected death toll. Oh, well, I'm looking through this book, and I've seen a lot of the destroyers and actual. And I turn one page, and I stop. Whoop, 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 whoop. I know that. There was the Summers class destroyer, the 2200, three mount twin, three mounts, if you know of those, they carried Twin mouths, two five inches, three of them. Here's the picture of the Zellers, whose number was the 777. She'd been out there two weeks when she took on one of the kamikaze raids. She took a kamikaze in the port quarter deck. The engine went down through the handling room right next to that and came out starboard side. Well, of course, our combat air patrol was in the immediate area, too, trying to shoot down kamikazes. Well, in that hit, the Zellers lost her doctor and pharmacist mate and several others, and they had fires. And I know exactly because we were requested to go alongside to help put out the fires and transfer. And when I looked at this picture, it's in the book there, one of our aircraft apparently took a picture of us pulling up alongside the Zellers. Hmm. And you can't tell it's me, but I know exactly where I was pulling up alongside, and there I am on the fantail. And I had to go on board and help put out some of the fires. And I know what these guys at the Twin Towers went through. But there's a, there was a picture of us, and we got hit later that day ourselves, hmm. again. So. What, uh what did you think about Truman's decision? Totally supported it. Totally supported it. Of course, at that time, I got to look back, and you can see from the number of acti actions and activities we had been in, uh, anything to get the war over. Mm -hmm. And after Okinawa, we went back and uh, to resupply and. We were then directed uh, to ADAC, Alaska, to prepare for the invasion of Japan. We were going to be part of the Northern Force for invading Japan. Of course, the, and then the war ended. Mm -hmm. What happened uh, once you heard the war was over? Emotionally, it was just just piece of information because we knew the problem would be how do all these submarines and other things know that it's over and are they still going to take a swat at you. Mm -hmm. But you did relax a little bit after a day or so because then we were escorting a carrier up to ADAC, Alaska and getting out of that awful heat of the South Pacific course. If I may, except when you're on general quarters, you would spend at least eight hours a day in an engine room operating on steam whose temperature was generally around 700 degrees Fahrenheit in the South Pacific and you would spend at least eight hours a day down there. Now why were you in the engine? Well that's where the generators were. Okay. We'd have to stand electrical watch on generators. Gotcha. There were two two engine rooms so you had to have at least eight electricians on a normal mm -hmm. shift. Mm -hmm. One on each generator. So it got a little warm. I got so I could take three or four salt tablets at a time and eat them with no problem. It tastes like candy. Water for us was, we had water, but you gotta, one has to keep in mind that all the water you make, the purest, has to go for your boilers. And uh, you, you have uh, the equipment to desalt the water, but then that equipment will cake up with salt, so you got to shut those down every so often and take them all apart. And <laughs> so you got to build up your reserve of pure water for the boilers and the rest for you. And 
Fresh water showers? No, never had them. Salt water. So when we went from that heat and years plus of that heat and plus the South Pacific and to sail up to Adak, Alaska, I remember we picked up some winter gear. <laughs> we arrived in Adak, Alaska, and here we were wearing these big heavy jackets and the guys are walking around in shirt sleeves. <laughs> but it felt good. It felt good to be cool. And then uh, when uh, ADAC, we went into the Omanado Naval Base to make the Navy present known at the Omanado Naval Base, which is the northern end of the island of Honshu. What was that experience like? It was interesting in the sense that uh, we could see some beat up ships there, and the captain let us take the whale boat. And we would ride as close to the beach as we could get. And when we come near, our, and I mean a naval base, it was junk, uh, wooden piers and so on. We come in these wooden piers, the little Japanese kids would come running out and wave to us in the circular wave. And I'll never forget, there were two, th two sounds they made, and this floored us. To this day, I don't understand it. They would usher words which would sound like, Urshi, Urshi. Oak. What they were asking for and how they knew to ask for this would be Hershey bars and Coke. <laughs> to this day, and I've got pictures where we took of these kids out there. The older uh, people, the boys, 12, 13, 14, or a few old men, they would sit on the shore and they wouldn't even smile or a thing. Because, mm -hmm. You know, after all, we were the big curly monsters. We're going to slice up them. And I can't blame them. So it was an experience to see that part of Japan as a naval base, but it was... Uh, Did you get on shore at all? No. We couldn't go on shore. And from Omanato, we then went down to Tokyo, pulled in there for a day. And then from Tokyo, we were sent back to Guam. And by this time, as we got down there, it was well into late September, mid-October, and we were wondering, why can't we get sent home? Well, we finally did get home very late October. And I remember that first night sitting in the San Diego Bay looking at the shore. Must have been a welcome sight. The next night I spent in the Balboa Hospital, and I mentioned that for a reason. I had had stomach problems, of course, who wouldn't with the lack of food and all this, because we were never, whenever we got supplies, it was always what we could bake, borrow, or steal, but never being assigned to a fleet. And I had a bad stomach, and I got sent into the Balboa Hospital, and I remember laying in that bed the first night. Women, yes, there really are such things. <laughs> and uh, I know from telling that story, my daughter, uh, when she decided to go Navy, asked to be assigned to the Balboa Naval Base. <laughs> and after the accident, when she finally got to the point where she could move around, she was sent to Balboa. <laughs> so that's, that's a little tie-in. Yeah. I remember setting, saying, and after San Diego, we were there for a couple of days. We got sent up to Bremerton, Washington, where the ship was to be repaired. And after certain repairs, I guess they came, I guess they came to realize that the ship was too beat up. So they sent us down to the Red Lead Row in San Diego. And I helped tie her up there where she sat until 1972 and she was sold for junk. Ship cost over 12 million to build, was sold, and I have the papers in that book. She was sold for $72,000 junk. So that's the story of my experience in the war, and I rode the Benyon, as I say, from before she was completed to the last turn of her screw. What, um, what did you, where did you, um, where did you leave the service? Where were you discharged? Dis Samson. 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 Yeah. Oh, what was Samson? 
I, I, I don't remember because we got into Sampson about 2 o'clock in the morning. We had been traveling for five plus days on a troop ship from San Diego. And I, they gave, gave us something to eat at the cafeteria and we went and grabbed some sleep. And that morning they started processing us. And that night I was so dead tired, I, I just went to bed. And the next morning they processed us. And about 4.30 that afternoon, here's your discharge papers, goodbye. So we walked out the gate. I remember the, the fellows at the gate said, don't worry, the Greyhound bus will be by here in about a half hour. They'll pick you up. So we stood out there. Sure enough, they picked us up. Rode to Scranton, got another bus from Scranton down to Harrisburg, and hitchhiked home. That was the end of your war. What'd you do after that? <laughs> Late low. <laughs> well, it was the latter part of March when I got out, and I, I was just so happy to be out for a while. I got a job back that I had had before I went to service, and that was a lifeguard of the State Lake in Pennsylvania. And the college where I had been in before had to take me back. Mm -hmm. So the college was only three blocks from where I was living. <laughs> and uh, this is a very honest experience. All I did was study, study, study. I left too many. You graduated? No, I, uh, I had no dates, wouldn't even take time for a date. No time. No, I wanted to go to engineering school. This was a liberal arts school, so I just took my basic liberal arts and then transferred to Marquette okay. with my buddy. Was he from the area? No, he's from Columbus, Ohio. But he decided to come out with you? Well, there's a little bit of a story there. His parents came to this country from Yugoslavia. They were Serbians, and uh, all his mother and father ever knew was work, 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 work. When he came out of the service, he got a job as an electrician and was installing a fan in the storeroom of a bar, and unfortunately he lost half a left hand in an accident with the fan. Well, I convinced him, along with his girlfriend, that he really ought to go to college. And so he went and picked up some credits he missed out of high school, and we went to college together. And you graduated from Marquette? Yeah, I graduated from Marquette. And after that? Well, as I say, the war had a great impact on my life. I had to take time to really, even at Marquette, I just study, 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 just trying to sort things out. All this killing, what was it about? So I went to seminary. Did that help? It takes time. Sure. And uh, that's what got me to this area. I had a church out here in Spencerport. Oh, okay. And I, I knew that I was not a pastoral type person, but I had to sort things out. And then I Left that and worked for Kodak as an engineer. But I served in churches for many, many years as what I called spare tire. If a church needed an interim, mm -hmm. I would step in for a year or so. Meanwhile, work at Kodak. Mm -hmm. It's taken a long time to sort things out. What's your, um, what's your general impression of your experience? Worth a million, but I wouldn't want to pay a penny for it. Worth a million. And as I say, it, you go back to all this killing, killing, suffering, try to grasp a hold of why. What can I do? So my life has been one of commitment. Uh, to try to help others. 
And if I may, I think I've accomplished that because I got involved in emergency medical services work. I've been honored with a few very prestigious awards, including the Red Cross presenting an award as the highest level that they will award to a volunteer. Locally, I've received one of the highest awards, unsolicited totally. I've served in ambulance work over 17 hours, 1,000 hours on duty. I was one of the very first certified EMT senior instructors. Done well for yourself. Others. <laughs> Others. Because what I can do for others is the only thing that counts. Well, we'd like to thank you very much. We appreciate it. Did a great job. Well, it's not so much what I did, it's the ship. Well, the you crew. Were, you were a part of the crew. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. But if you see, I got to deflect it. All right. I. Uh, Present a little talk at the memorial service, the 50th anniversary of the uh, commissioning and the, uh, well, actually, the laying of the keel. And I said it was the spirit of the ship. The spirit is like the wind. You can't see it, but you know it by what it does. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome.